First Spin. Welcome to First Spin, a show where I learn how to use the parallax propeller without having any prior programming experience. And rather than do this on my own, I have enlisted the help of two experts. Hello. Howdy. Hello. How are you guys? Okie dokie. Okie dokie. Yeah. Excellent. I wish I were doing some propeller hacking. Yeah, what have you been doing? I've been working on our little recording studio here. Oh. Make this show sound a little bit echoey less. You've been a carpenter. Yeah. <laughs> been doing Toymaker Construction Company, but Eddie's been hacking. It's true. I've been working on servos and ping sensors and uh, compass modules. So, yeah. But uh, in the line of uh, modules and peripherals that we've been going through, so we've already gone through the... Um, mm. Ping. The ping sensor and the five position switch, right, from okay. Parallax. Uh, so today I thought we could go into the RC servo. Yeah. Woohoo. Now, I have a question. Uh, for those who don't know what an RC servo is, could one of you guys explain to them what it is? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, <laughs> so it's it's a, a small motor with some gearing to give it a little bit of torque and then it's got a little bit of in, built into it it's got a little circuit board and a potentiometer mm -hmm. and in an, a standard servo the servo turns either 90 or 180 or some fixed amount that it can turn from one side to the other mm -hmm. and that's turning the potentiometer which is a feedback mechanism all built inside the servo and then uh you you communicate to the servo over a signal line and you send it pulses of a certain length and the length of the pulse tells it where to turn to in its swing that it can turn and that pulse is between one millisecond and two milliseconds long. Okay. And if it's at 1.5 milliseconds, the server will be in the middle of its swing, they call it. So, you know, it'll be centered. And then if it's at two milliseconds, it'll be all the way over to one side of its swing. And if it's at one millisecond, it'll be all the way over to the other side of its swing. And by centered, you mean stopped, right? Well, no, because with a standard servo, it's always stopped at whatever position it's at. What you've been working with, which is a little different, is a continuous rotation servo. And those are modified so that they don't actually stop when they get to the end of their swing from left to right. Okay. They just keep turning in the direction. And the larger the pulse width, so if you're at... 1500 and the, you know it's it varies a little bit depending on the servo but around 1500 it'll be stopped mm -hmm. and then the closer you get to two milliseconds or from 1.5 to two milliseconds it'll start going faster in one direction and if you go from 1.5 down to one it'll start going faster in the other direction okay right? and those are that's a continuous rotation servo and for a little bit a little, of uh history on those um when I first getting in, got into this sort of stuff, you really couldn't buy continuous rotation servos. You would buy, you know, a uh, uh, 180 or whatever, mm -hmm. and you'd open it up and you'd cut the little bits out that stopped it on both ends. <laughs> and you'd, you know, modify it so that it would just keep, you know, rotating past that point. Ooh, right. I see. And you would actually take the potentiometer off of the, the motor pin and... Uh, do you know there's a, a slight modification that you had to do beyond that to get it to actually work because obviously okay. a pot stops at the end too so right yeah now um these sorts of things are useful for doing stuff like steering on a uh a little rc car or controlling the uh the lifters on a RC so the wheels plane be or you know, something like that where you're you're pushing thing in something in one direction and then pulling it back. Right. We're talking about we've we switched back to the non continuous oh, rotation. Right. Whereas a um, standard servo just moves a fixed like it'll go from one eighty to zero. You know, it'll just go back and forth between two positions at ex extremes. Yeah. It doesn't keep turning like you're used to with the continuous rotation one. Okay. Yeah. So you could use it to like, you know, make a physical linkage between its servo horn and something to move it 
one direction and then pull it back. Okay. Right. And then so you could have, when we when we got the continuous <laughs> rotation servos kick in, one of the the fun uses t- for them was to use two of them and then hook them to wheels. Ah. Uh. And then, you know, leave the third wheel of a platform so that it could sort of slide back and forth a little bit if the wheels are going in opposite directions. Right. That gives you the ability to have a robot that can turn left, right, oh, roll forward, sure. roll backwards, yep, whatever. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah. D- and, differential drive, they usually call it. Mm, so, you know, th- that's the, the basic uh, history of why they're, you know, um, where they come from, why we started using them, and what they're used for in this context most of the time. Right. And uh, the, the more advanced use of these things is, I think, pretty much exactly what you're trying to do uh, at the moment. But uh, we we would have <laughs> all done it for different reasons than you're doing it. But you're <laughs> Addy, so that's that's normal. So just to let you guys know, I'm trying to make um, a, a ping camera, essentially ping sonar <laughs> camera, um, by using the distances from the ping to make a picture. Well, obviously, so ping camera. Um, but in order to do that, I have to have the ping sweep from left to right in a pretty controlled fashion. Um, and so that's where the compass module gets involved. So the compass module will be on the RC servo, and it'll go about like every five degrees or something like that. And then every five degrees, the ping sensor will get a measurement. And then based on that measurement, I'm hoping to do some sort of like grayscale photo thing so. well, we'll see how that works out for you <laughs> but well, uh initially you're only going to be able to do a line right yeah because yeah. the servo is just going right and left but you could put a, another servo and make it go up and down and then you could do a 2d grid right yeah. so i have the ping working actually that's not even that that there's no problem with that but right now it's figuring out how to get the rc servo to move appropriately yeah so that's why I thought we should cover she's, she's RC She's taking servos. baby steps towards her big, her big idea. Here. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> so, so that's your introduction to to servos there, right? So, so what's your your question beyond that? Well, okay. So just to let uh, any newbies know, um, usually RC servos have like three lines coming out of them: one for power, one for ground, and one for the signal. Um, and as Roy had mentioned earlier, the signal is a pulse with modulation signal. So depending on the pulses that you send to it, um, that'll tell it tell the servo which direction to go, whether that's center, left, or right, or counterclockwise or clockwise uh, in my continuous servo example. Um, and Whereas in a non-continuous, you know, a standard servo, the pulses pick where to rotate to on it. Right. Relative. Yeah. Right. Exact it's got positioning. That, it's got right. that feedback loop going with the uh, potentiometer in there. Right. right. Um, and then to find out where those three lines, like, because they're all different colors usually, you have to go to the data sheet because different servos have different colors. Like sometimes the red might be the signal, but sometimes the red's the power or sometimes the red's the ground. So yeah. you can't assume for there, all the servos. There's two fairly common standards and they are opposite coloring or very different coloring from each other but most of them are black and red for ground and power and then white for white or yellow for signal Mm -hmm. and then there's a different kind that are like orange yellow and red and those are like completely different arrangement than the other ones Mm -hmm. i think that you have to be careful i think the parallax ones use uh black for ground red for power white for signal yeah, this parallax standard and yep. continuous servos use those color yep. schemes. That is correct. And like I said, that that's a fairly common color scheme, but there are some servos out there that are different. So obviously, if you're going to use a servo and it doesn't have, you know, standard coloring, then you should look up on the data sheet or the instructions that came with it to see what the you know wiring is mm-hmm. for it. I know I open up Addies at least once a week and change them around. What? <laughs> That explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you thought those were bugs in your coat. No. Nope. <laughs> Just pranks. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. That explains why I'll I have a bald spot on my... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, I, now that, I mean... 
I don't want to belabor like how these work. So I guess we'll just go into the code if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it, they sound kind of complicated when you explain them out like that. But honestly, um, when you're using one of the provided uh, drivers for them, mm-hmm. they're pretty pretty simple to use. I mean, right. it, it doesn't take too much reading or listening in this case to figure out that it's basically plug and play. Right. right. So I, of course, took the difficult way through this. You are Eddie. Yes. Yeah. I, <laughs> so we'll go through two two ways today. The first will be my complicated way based off <laughs> of a code that I believe was on the Parallax page for the RC servo, the continuous uh, RC servo. Um, but right. then we'll also cover the object that you can use uh, provided by Parallax because, well, I, until about half an hour ago, did not realize there was an object. <laughs> yeah. So well, we'll go through well, that. One good thing about going through your method is that it's, it's a pretty good example of using the counter system stuff right. in the cog. Right? right. So people can look at it and follow through and get a, a little bit better understanding of the counter stuff. Right. Potentially. Right. So um, I will direct you guys to, and let me let me give you a link, Roy, and you can click on it, and I think we'll go through that code because it's actually correct. Okay. Okay. Okay, and I'll give you guys the link as well. Um, so It'll be in the description. Correct. Parallax RC Servo Part Three: My Own Code. Um, so. We'll start with the con section. Obviously, that's easy. Clock mode is the crystal thingy plus the uh-huh. PLL um, augmentation, right. I guess. X and Freak, right? X and Freak is uh, five megahertz for the um, the, the crystal. crystal. Plug-in. Yep. Right. And then I've also decided to use uh, the section to dictate that servo pin is equal to zero. So right. that means the signal line of my servo will be plugged into pin zero's location. Right. Okay. Um, and then pub servo, we have a whole bunch of uh, uh, variables, local variables. Um, and T ink, uh, I guess we can skip just down a little bit. T ink is clock freak or the number of cycles uh, that equals one second divided by 1 million um and that's i think that calculates out what like a millisecond it's uh yeah, it's yeah. 1 millisecond in clock ticks okay or micro or is it microsecond 1 microsecond 1 sorry. microsecond okay because we don't yeah. want to do floating point math i think we want to yeah. i i always mix up milli and, and micro, micro because milli sounds like million and i want to say millionth Right. But it's thousandth. So it's just microseconds, essentially. Right. Um, for Tink. And then TC is uh, the... So between it's, each pulse width, it, there is a required um, 20, 20 microseconds. Millis, 20 milliseconds. No, 20 milliseconds. <laughs> yes, 20,000 microseconds, which but, is 20 milliseconds. Right. And what that is is that most servos want the pulse that get sent to them only sent every 20 milliseconds not continuously okay some servos can actually accept it faster some will accept it once and not need it repeated okay others want it to be continuously sent and so it's it's just a a good habit to just do it this way because most servos will work this way so it's not literally pulse width modulation it's a little bit more specific eddie what do you mean right well, it is sending out a, a sized, a certain size pulse at a regular rate. Mm-hmm. It's just a very slow rate. It's not oh. continuous. It's you know, yeah. oh, I very see. specifically I see. timed. So it's information then break of 20, of 20 uh, milliseconds. Information right. break, information break, information break. Right. And then the information is dictated by T center, TCTR, um, T clockwise, CW, TCW, and TCCW, which is um counterclockwise so you see that the center um i had to calibrate a little bit for the uh for the servo and i found that instead of 1500 um or yeah 1500 microseconds i think right right it was actually 1490 to stop it 
Right, but here's here's the deal. If you look on the servo itself on the side, mm -hmm. there's a little hole. Do you see it? Yeah. Oh, that, I can calibrate little, it? You can actually adjust it. <laughs> and so what you're supposed to do is set it to 1500 and then turn that little screw oh. on the side of the servo until it stops moving. Oh, you learn something new every day. And here I was thinking <laughs> I had mastered this. Oh, hey, that's cool. I'm going to have to do that after the show. <laughs> <laughs> right, and so then, then your code can be 1500 for center, and that will equal oh, stop sweet. on a continuous servo. Good, because the last time I calibrated, like in just working on it not too long ago, it was like 1520. Yeah, it'll it'll move around a little bit depending on the circuit you're using it with, and if it got bumped uh, around, you might need to adjust the little potentiometer in there a little bit. Oh. And uh, <laughs> uh, just to be clear, uh, this is code that Addie wrote, and uh, she she put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into it. Yes, and she's <laughs> she's basically manually bit banging out the signal to send off uh, to control servo in spin, right? To manually right. do it. Right. Normally, oh. you guys would use an object right. uh, from right. Parallax. Right. Uh, what's the one you like, Roy? It's the Servo 32 V7, which comes with the prop tool. Yeah, and, and that'll control a bunch of servos all at once. It uses PASM, but you can obviously yeah. just plug it right into your, your spin code. Mm -hmm. um, so it, this may sound a little bit complicated the way that Addy's doing it. I assure you, it is this, not as complicated as Addy makes it. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing to be clear on is she's bit banging but she's using the counters to get the timing exactly right even though spin would normally not be exactly right using the counters which are hardware makes it be the right length pulse all the time right and we're, we'll go into that i just wanted to ex so then I'm, I'm just explaining the where yep. those numbers come from so then right. so then clockwise um 1300 makes the uh servo go clockwise and then 1700 uh, microseconds, I guess, makes uh, the servo go counterclockwise. Right. And so what, just letting what, you guys know where that comes from. And, and what those values are is, like we said earlier in the show, the pulse that you send a servo is somewhere between one millisecond and two milliseconds. Mm -hmm. And so 1300 microseconds is 1.3 milliseconds. Right. right, so it's right. closer to one millisecond, and then the seventeen hundred is one point seven milliseconds, so it's closer to two. Correct. And of course, we're and, dealing with a microcontroller here, so uh, we get our time based off of our known clock frequency. So right, right. And part of the reason we're using these large numbers like this instead of one point seven is because the propeller doesn't have floating point natively, so we're using integer values and multiplying it by a thousand so we can get some precision which i think we've talked about uh in earlier episodes oh yeah mm -hmm. yep just just a reminder is all yep so uh i guess if my question since you know i am supposed to have some questions <laughs> uh <laughs> is how are we using the counters here in order right. to get it going get it working right so so one of the, you skipped over a couple of lines at the beginning of the program there, right. which is configuring the counter into one of its several modes. Mm -hmm. And the mode it's being set into right now is called NCO, um, which is uh, numerically controlled output. Okay. And what that just, that's just a fancy way of saying the value that you set in the phase, the PHSA register is controlling the output oh, right that's okay. just it you're you're driving the output based on a value and um so it's configuring the clock into that mode and then the other oh. thing it's doing there is telling the counter which pin to drive right right so right, the zero right, to right, eight right. is your servo pin right because 30 to dot dot 26 is the bits in the counter, in the counter, and for then configuring the mode, right? And then eight dot dot zero is are the bits in counter A controlling which or dictating pin, which pin to the right. that counter will control, right? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Yep. Okay. And and the mode again is NCO single ended is the full name mm -hmm. of the mode, mm -hmm. and and really all that means is it's just driving the pin. 
based on the PHS A or B, if you're using counter B, mm -hmm. uh, the bit 31, whatever the state of bit 31 is, then the pin will be that state. Okay. And uh, it also means that the value in PHS A will get added into FRQA every clock cycle. We talked about all these things in previous shows, but you know, the basic idea is we're setting up a mode where it's going to every, every clock cycle, the value that we put in the PHSA register, which is the phase register will get added to the FRQA, which is the frequency register. Okay. And that means that it's just going to count up PHSA and eventually it'll wrap back around to zero. Like we've talked about in the past. And when the 31 pit bit of PHSA is high, which is for half the values as it's counting up, right? Uh, the output pin will be high. And when bit 31 is low, which is the other half of the values, when it's down at a low value, um, then the pin will be low or off. Okay. So that's the mode that it's in, the counter mode. And then uh, what we, the next thing that it configures is the frequency a value is one mm -hmm. um and it's just starting it you know saying uh we're only going to add one every time to phsa for every clock cycle so we're using a bunch of little trickery here to uh actually get that thing to flip over using its sign bit and the sign bit flipping back and forth is what's actually you know, linking to turn the pin on and off. And right. uh, it, it's, this is, this is how you can do it. If, if you want to get into the, you know, literal, you know, getting in there, doing it yourself, but right. you don't have to. <laughs> right. So <laughs> Again, uh, this is, we, we've this is... got, you know, like eight minutes left and you guys said you wanted to talk about the other way too. So yeah, well, we, we that will only take like two minutes. So we need to finish a little bit more explanation of this, this way. Okay. Because we haven't really gotten to the meat of it yet. Okay. Just the repeat loops, right? Right. Yeah. So and they're modular, so, so. Right. So we've we've got everything all configured. We've set our servo output the pin to be an output because we're going to drive it. That's the dura there in this code. Mm -hmm. So then we get down. We can just explain the first loop and all the other loops work the same. They just have different values. Mm -hmm. So what this is doing is, uh, first it's just going to repeat a hundred times, which means it's going to send a hundred pulses out to the servo mm -hmm. to set it to a position. Mm -hmm. um, then it's going to take the PHSA register and set it to a value. And that value is how many clock ticks to count before it wraps back around to zero. Okay. And we calculated it up above the TCW in this case is, how many clock ticks because T inc is how many clock ticks in a microsecond. And then we're multiplying that by 1300 because we want to go 1300 microseconds. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go some large number of clock ticks, right? Mm -hmm. And we're setting PHSA to negative that value. And the reason that that works is because it's loading it up so that it'll have the high bit set because it's a negative number. Okay. And 31 in the, in the top bit is the sign bit. Okay. And it's setting up how many clock ticks are going to go by before it then wraps back to zero. And when it wraps back to zero, the high bit goes down back down to zero, right? Uh, so the pin will go down to zero. Uh, so, so the negative is to make sure that it goes high first. Right. So we're I setting see. it to a value that forces the bit, the pin to go high. I see. Right. And then well, it counts, handy. it counts one, one count per clock tick. Yeah. And eventually after that many clock ticks goes by, it'll go back to zero. Okay. And so in layman's then, terms, that couple lines there, you know, using the numbers above is just saying, you know, we're going to prime it so that it comes on. And our number that we set up above is saying when it's going to turn right back off. So that's the pulse width that we we're talking about earlier. Mm -hmm, right. Mm hmm. And then the next two lines are just taking the current time, mm -hmm. which is the CNT value it just got above. Current clock cycle, yeah. Right. And then it's going to wait that 20 milliseconds. Right. So it's going to do the pulse, then it's going to wait the 20 milliseconds. 
and then in it's layman's back terms, and do another pulse. And in layman's terms, that's the you know the 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 regular interval of when those pulses are supposed to happen. I right, see. is in that weight. I and see. we're using the weight count and thing, which we've gone over before, but it's just weight that many clock cycles. Right, it's what that's I saying see. to do. So as you guys can tell, this is like it's not super hard to pull off, but that we have a much easier way. Right. <laughs> right. So the much easier way you can find in several places, but one of the more uh, you know friendly places is over on the Kickstart mm-hmm. pages at learn.parallax.com. Yep. You can go to the Parallax Standard Servo, and uh, it shows an example of using the Servo V7 object, Servo32 V7, which again comes with prop tool. Mm-hmm. And all you have to do is, uh, you know, include that object. And if, you, if you're on that page, you can see where it has an object, Servo colon Servo32 V7 spin. Mm-hmm. And then in your main code, you do a Servo.start, which is just telling it to start going, and it actually gets it running in another cog. They have really simple oh, example you for, code. You forgot the servo right CH there. one. The what? Huh? You forgot mentioning that you have to set the servo pin. Well, yeah, the the, the servo that's just in the con. It's very similar to yours, right? Servo yeah. CH one equals zero is just the servo pin equals zero. Yeah. Um, but in your main code, you then do the servo start, and then you do servo set, and then the pin number which in this case is servo CH1 for channel one, mm-hmm. um, but it's, it's a zero mm-hmm. for the pin zero, and then comma the, the pulse width size in microseconds. So 2,000 is two milliseconds, mm-hmm. and 1,000 is one millisecond. So mm-hmm. you can set it to any value between those two mm-hmm. and with the set, and it will set the servo to that value. And it will keep going in the background until you tell it to go somewhere else. Now, in the kickstart, it says repeat eight eight hundred thousand. What's that? Eight hundred thousand cycles? No, that's just uh, in spin. If you do a repeat eight any number, yeah. it just waits a little while because uh, spin is kind of slow, and each loop of the repeat takes a couple, you know, microsecond or two. Mm-hmm. And so, if you do a whole bunch of them, it's like a little pause. This is just like a simple way to do a a small pause instead of using weight count and having to calculate a clock frequency value to weight on. I see. Now say... It's just a small pause. Okay. So say I use this servo code with um, my little owl project. I'm calling it an owl project. Uh, And I want it to say uh, stop when the compass equals five degrees. Right. right. So how would I do that? Servo dot well, set servo channel one comma. I don't know. Say it's whatever, going. Well, whatever your center value is, which 1500. is fifteen hundred. Yeah. Right. So you would pass that in. Okay. And it could be in a variable like you do in your other program. Yeah. Um. So you would set up a loop, right? That you would read the compass, and it would give you what direction it's facing, and then you would calculate what direction you want it to face subtracted from that to get an error term. And then you would use that as an offset from 1500, right? To go plus or minus to make the servo move one way or the other. And when that error term became zero, you would be at 1500 and the servo would be stopped. But how, I mean, how? You would just do servo set instead of your few lines of code that use the PHSA Regist- you know. Hmm. Okay. So in, in your other code, you have that repeat loop that's going, setting PHSA and then doing a weight count. Yeah. Right. You don't need that. You would just replace that four lines of code with servo.set to a value. I see. And it would just set it to that value. Okay. Easy enough. All righty. So if you guys have any questions on servos, please Let us email know. us yes. at uh, feedback at tymkrs.com. And, uh, you know, if it's appropriate, we'll definitely try to answer them on the show. Um, this yeah. week, we got an email from um, David Smith. 
on the Parallax forums, uh-huh. and it sounds like he's uh, thinking about starting up a project of maybe trying to design an EKG uh, based around a propeller. Uh-huh. And he was wondering if we could uh, maybe uh, throw <laughs> some ideas out there for him. Uh, th- this week's show was already in the works, but uh, we're going to think about that. And uh, Dave, make sure you tune in next week because I think we're gonna we're gonna devote a little bit of time to it. Well, we'll try. Yeah, uh, that sounds like it might be fun. Ed, Eddie's a cool. <laughs> Eddie's a cardiac nurse, so you know she knows about this kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's <laughs> all the time we have for this week. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone for listening. Uh, we'll be back next Tuesday with another episode of First Spin. You can find the show at firstspin.tv. There's um, RSS feeds there for your your music players, uh, so you can automatically download the show. Yeah, make sure you check the show description if you wanted to look at any of the links that we put out there, uh, the source code, stuff like that. It's a lot easier to follow along if you can read along. Yep. Um, so that's it for us for this week. We'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye. Bye. See ya.